Thank God for your life. Thank God for your service. Thank those that have gone on ahead of us fighting for our freedom, fighting for our liberties. Thank you. Come on, just tell somebody standing next to you that, sir, tell them thank you, thank you. I want you to remain standing. We have a prayer that we're going to do as a congregation. We have a prayer that we're going to do as a congregation. It's going to be on the screens for you. I'm going to read it. It's going to be in concert. I'll read the first slide. You'll read the next slide. And this is a prayer for our soldiers. We thank God that he is the one that protects anybody on the battlefield. Come on, somebody. And he's protecting our family that is even now serving for our freedom. Almighty God. I'm going to read the first slide, y'all read the next slide. Almighty God, we commend to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Together defend them with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and their temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Lord, hold our troops in your loving hands. Protect them as they protect us. Bless them and their families for the selfless acts they perform for us in our time of need. I ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Can we just give God one more praise for our troops, those that serve faithfully. Before you sit down, I want you just to thank God for the choir. What they're getting ready to do is they're going to sing some stuff that's not traditional for our church. It's going to be a little hymny. Somebody say thank God for the hymns. So I don't want y'all to fall asleep. I want y'all to thank God for this choir and this music ministry as they go forth in a hymn that's reflective of our soldiers and our military. Thank God for you. Let's thank God for the music ministry. And you may be seated in God's presence.
Church to all of you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's delighted, a delight for me to be here, and I greet you with Jesus' joy. Uh, what a delight it is to be in your presence and to share this time today. I thank God. I, I appreciate your staff's uh, ready assistance to my needs. I'm not the one that likes to hold the mic because I preach with my hands. And uh, I'm thankful to the Lord for this privilege. Isn't God good? It's been a few years. It's been a few years since I have been here. And uh, you can tell that if you saw that picture from back in 19, um, um, that Reverend had up on the screen. Uh, I'm not going to tell you when that was, but uh, it's a joy. First Lady, it's a delight. And uh, I praise God. We know we are operating under constraints. The text for today, uh, for our consideration, I came to pour my heart into you. I called as I came here to do a conference at another uh, venue, and I asked uh, Pastor, I told him I was coming, and that if he needed a break, he didn't have to, and he said, man, you need to come. And so I'm thankful for this privilege and just for his being so generous, uh, and I want to pour into you today to be a blessing out of Philippians chapter 4, uh, simply verse 19, the context is... Uh, the entire book, verses 10 through 19, capture the essence of what I want to try to give attention to today. However, it's such a familiar passage. You, if you are uh, even a new believer, many first uh, uh, early Christians today and neophytes 
claim this verse as something that they want to cite on a regular basis when it simply says, but my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That sounds like to me that membership has its privileges. Yeah. Yeah, shake hands with somebody, if you will, and tell them, say, membership has its privileges. In fact, if I was uh, really going to call it something, I'm simply preaching today about how you can get your needs met. Yeah, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let me ask you a quick question. Who wants to be a millionaire? All right, some of y'all playing. I'll raise both my hands because I promise you I really want to get paid. I do, I do, I do, but not perhaps for some, the same reason as do some. That's so much I want to do for the kingdom. Uh, it's not about me. Uh, I look at the lifestyles of the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, the Ross Perot's, the uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, who's from Omaha, Nebraska, uh, even uh, these NBA uh, players and owners and National Football League uh, athletes and owners. Uh, I mean, they really live the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. You know, and sometimes are just squandering a whole lot of that. We look at it enviably, hoping that one day our ship will come in. Yeah, we're working, trying our best to get to the east side, making our way to the top, when in fact, uh, statistics say most of us won't get there. In truth, the reality is that many of us listening to me today will barely live right at or above the poverty line. But I promise you, I'll bet you every last one of us would be as happy as a hippopotamus <laughs> if we could simply get our needs met. And I would like to suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, that the Apostle Paul sends this uh, note to his beloved colleagues in Philippi to reassure them that God inherently, because of your relationship with him, promise that he will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Now, let me quickly provide this disclaimer. This is not a blank check for every believer to feel like you can claim this just because you are a member of the family of God. It doesn't work like that. This is to a particular community of people. It is a specific word designed for their lives in light of some things. It's their responsible behavior that uh, beholds God to them, that essentially gets them this word detailed for their circumstances. God's going to take care of your needs, he says. Whose needs? In this passage, it happens to be the Philippians. Yeah, this is a, a, a particular community uh, in Rome in the Macedonian province where Paul established a church when he and his entourage, Luke is the uh, church historian and he is uh, on the team. There's young Timothy who got converted in Derby. There's Silas who's with them. You know, he and Paul spent some time in jail in this same town. And then uh, 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 he had just split with uh, Barnabas in chapter 15. But the bottom line is Paul is telling them it's for them. It's for them. Who are these people? I want to tell you, first of all, it's this church who had some substantial needs. They did. It was a church with substantial needs. They are trying to do the work of ministry, yet they had some substantial needs. They didn't have a lot of members. Yeah, this is not the Metropolitan Commonwealth of Corinth. Not a huge uh, uh, area where they got flights coming in and out. This, they didn't have a whole lot of members in this church. Uh, in fact, it started in a woman's house by the name of Lydda. She's the first church trustee because she owned the keys to the place where the church met. Whoosh, you're going to get it in a minute. Yeah, uh, but, but they didn't have a lot of mean, uh, money. They did not have a lot of money, not members, but not also a lot of money. This is not the affluent congregation in Ephesus. Yeah, where they, they, there was a rich fellowship there. I mean, gifted on the one hand, but they had uh, real resources from which they could draw to do some great things. They didn't have a lot of members, didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of means. That was opportunity, so says verse 10 in the text, that tells us that they could take the time to uh, do what we do today. Uh, if anybody like me, you sit up here looking at me, if you've got kids that have been in college, uh, the fact is you have to sit down and you will... Uh, uh, you can sit at your banking institution and wire them some money. 
You can send it in a nanosecond with the push of the send key. Won't even cost you a dime. It's some parents in here listening to me. I know you want to say, I know that's right. Because you're ready for them to become fully liberated adults, aren't you? Okay, I got to break that. You know what a fully liberated adult is, don't you? Let me help you. That means grown, gone, on your own, doing no wrong, and leaving your money alone. Yeah, I know somebody looking forward to that right now. Yeah, yeah. so they didn't have the means to do those kinds of things that are at our disposal. But without a lot of members, without a lot of money, without a lot of means, they had liberal minds. They had liberal minds. Keep in mind that Paul is addressing this to this congregation because of their partnership with him in the work of ministry. Yeah, we praying for resources and we want stuff. And God's watching uh, your heart as relates to why you want it. It is to advance the kingdom. If you think, Anthony Moore, and uh, this ministry is about building nice facilities, it, it's about reaching the lives of people. There are some new demons that were born this morning in the hospitals in the area. That lest they have an encounter with Jesus Christ... They're going to be jacking your car and breaking into your house and they're going to be stealing stuff and causing your resources to be stretched further than they already are. Uh, it has everything to do with not your interest in what you need, but your heart for the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus writes, uh, uh, Matthew writes about the Lord Jesus. He recalls him saying in Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and guess what will happen? All these things will be added unto you. This church had substantial needs. Let me hasten to move and tell you that not only did they have substantial needs, but yet they were sensitive to others' needs. Yeah, because in lieu of the fact that Paul had come to that town and God had moved their hearts, they decided we want to be a blessing to the work that's going on. And how did they do that? That's, that's key because when you love the Lord, you can't help but want to help advance the message of the kingdom. Yeah, when you, you can't say God without saying give. No, 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 no. You act like I'm, I'm not talking in Bible territory. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, oh, so you've been reading your Bible. Yeah, that he gave, and I'm saying when your heart is uh, impacted in light of what the Lord has d delivered you from, well, I must not be talking to a delivered church. I mean, you ain't always looked like the Christian you're looking like today. Some of you have been on skid row. Uh, I, I should have busted hell wide open. I, I'm, I'm convinced, Reverend, with all these electronics you got in your church, we need a, a, a shout button because I just pushed it. Now, when you think about the fact that you ought to be busting hell wide open and the Lord has rescued you, that your name has been written on the Lamb's book of life, it moves your heart and it causes you to say, I, I, I need to do, do, do something. How do you do that? Well, first of all, by not being selfish. Say, Lord, help me not to be selfish. Yeah, I know that self-preservation is the first law of nature and people... Uh, in this world are always looking out for numero uno. Yeah, we're looking out for number one. And it amazes me the number of people who are in this thing. They're living this life just for themselves, trying to get paid. They want this, that, and the other. Got dreams to have. Some girl, no doubt, wants some dude to come and sweep her up like a knight in shining armor. You're waiting on your boo or your bow to come and do whatever he's going to do. Uh, if whether he's a, pro a professional in whatever capacity, so you don't have to do nothing but stay at home and keep the mall's lights on. But I'm here to tell you, you can't be selfish. You, ca you can't be selfish. Relationships are not about you. Uh, in fact, marriage is not about you. Yeah, it, it's not even for you. Now, in, 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 any uh, single people in here today, let me see your hand. Mine's up. I, I just want to ask you, any single folk in here? Can I tell you something? I hate to hurt you. Marriage is not for you. I'm just telling you. If you're not married, it's not for you. How many married people in here? I need to tell you. Marriage is not for you. It's for the other person. 
Yeah, in other words, it's not about what you can get out of it. It's about what you're willing to pour into it. And I'm telling you that, that while Jesus came to save you, that he came uh, to teach you some things. That, that's why he says, if you're going to come after me, let every man, let a woman, let him do what? Deny self. Say, Lord, help me not to be selfish. Yeah, this, this church was not being selfish. They chose to be supportive. And verse 10 again tells us that they, even at verse 14, Paul says they contributed. They gave, you gave. When you didn't have opportunity, when you didn't have means, yet you've renewed your support to me. You've given, you've shown concern by bring, sending and offering. The uh, missionary in the first church uh, in this text is uh, Epaphroditus, and he brings money to Paul who's incarcerated, but he needs ink for his quill and some parchment upon which to write. He perhaps needs some postage to get this stuff in the mail and of course he needs toiletries, soap, shaving paraphernalia. He needs all the things that we need to survive and this fellowship alone was willing to be supportive to him. Yeah, that, that, I'm, I'm simply trying to say my friend that when you make that decision uh, that's a matter of the will. Yeah, I, I would promise you today that if you really, really want to get blessed, that uh, you need to sow a seed into this work or this ministry. That I, I feel that, mm, as, as a matter of fact, I'm feeling a thousand dollar offering over on this side, about 10 of y'all on this side, and about, about four or five, ten thousand dollar gifts coming this way. Come on with it. Come on with it now. Paul didn't hoodwink the church to persuade them to do stuff that God had laid upon their heart to do. It's a matter of the will. Yeah, yeah. You, when you give, it's not because somebody necessarily asks you. They may create an opportunity, but it's because you want to. When the Lord told Moses in Exodus chapter 35 to bring me an offering, tell the people to bring me an offering to construct the, the tabernacle, the Bible says in verse 35, uh, chapter 35, all throughout the passage that those who were uh, uh, willing and those on whose heart the Lord had moved, the women who were wise-hearted, giving is a matter of the heart. You got to want to. Uh, 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 particularly when you recognize that the work of the ministry is going to uh, change lives and communities, uh, you have to want to be supportive. Say, Lord, help me to be supportive. And I would suggest that while they, they didn't have means to get there, your money can make it there when you can't be there. But you ought not stop with just giving your money alone. Because that helps me also to tell you that they chose to suffer. Mm, I know that's not a comfortable term in Christian today because we don't want to go through nothing. In fact, I've been working on a, an argument about this whole notion of Christian suffering, and I, I, I really have come to some conclusions that, uh, unfortunately, there are those of us who entered in this work, and for, to a large degree, we think worship and, and, and the work of ministry is all about good music, the great uh, songsters, the psalmist, and the dance, and all that kind of stuff, and, and we're having to teach people how to do what, when they're grateful, they'll do anyway. Yeah, you, you don't have to teach a child to be happy when you're giving them some candy. Yeah, nor do you have to teach a saint, a true grateful believer, how to give thanks when they're grateful. Yeah, I, I have a premise that suggests that there, there are three, essentially three kinds of suffering. And I want you to listen to this in the interest of what this church has done. There is what I call uh, coincidental circumstantial suffering. That's the suffering through which we go based upon our being a part of the coincidences and the circumstances of life. Tsunamis happen, tornadoes occur, hurricanes transpire, uh, uh, the earthquakes and other natural phenomenons, comets and uh, uh, things fall out of the sky and you may become collateral damage because of those uncontrollable uh, circumstances, those coincidences in the wise providence of God, in his permissive will, it happened and correlatedly you may have to suffer. That's what I'm calling the circumstantial coincidental suffering and we suffer. Don't you believe nobody when they tell you that you don't have to. I don't care if they tell you if you name it and claim it, you can speak the devil uh, into hell if you want to and claim, no, you're going to have to go through something. I'm trying without using profane language to tell you that stuff just happens, okay? 
Yeah. And then secondly, I want to tell you that's what I call causal or consequential suffering. It's directly related to something to which you're going, uh, whether or not uh, uh, you can, uh, the cause and effect issue is at work in this uh, result. If you don't go to work, the result is you're going to get fired. If you don't work, you won't eat. If you eat too much, you're going to get fat. If you drink, you're going to uh, perhaps get sclerosis of the liver. You smoke uncontrollably, you may get emphysema, lung cancer. Uh, if some fool walks into a mall or goes into a school and starts shooting, that you, you may not be the victim, uh, uh, the volunteer in that regard, but you could be victimized by that, and it will bring suffering into your life. But you can directly associate that suffering with something uh, that, you ha that has been done, whether by you or somebody else. But then here's the issue that I want to really uh, lift about the Philippians. There's what is called conciliatory or kingdom conscious suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of suffering where you've identified the work of God in a particular area. You recognize that that's going to cost you in advance and you go there anyway to join God. Yes. Did you get that? Yeah, it's what Jesus did. He, he wasn't blindsided by Calvary. He chose to go there anyway. Yeah, and that's why Paul writes to his son Timothy and said, if there's no cross, there'll be no ground. So if you ain't trying to inconvenience yourself for Jesus, do you think Calvary was a convenient experience? He chose to do that. I'm simply trying to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that somebody has duped the contemporary church into thinking that we don't have to go through nothing. If you love God, you do. If you're grateful to him, you do. Yeah, I'm suggesting to you, my friends, that the, the word conciliatory is where we get the word reconcile. It means that there's some benefit, something to gain as a result of my doing it. And you know that that's what a cross is. In fact, here's how you can guarantee if the suffering that you're experiencing is a cross. It's a vehicle of redemption. That is, somebody's going to be saved through it. That it's voluntarily received. That you took it on yourself. It just didn't become your lot. Don't call your sickness uh, a cross because why would you be spending all that money at the hospital and at the pharmacy trying to get rid of it if it was a cross? Your mama on her deathbed, that's not a cross because if you, you wouldn't be praying for her healing if it was something that you were willing to hold on to. It's voluntarily received and the voices of recall are always trying to tell you, come down, save yourself. You ain't got to go through that. And I promise you, if you could get rid of some of the stuff you're having to deal with, you would. That's not a cross. When you're bearing a cross, you're bearing it because you want to. You've chosen to suffer. I know this ain't popular for the church because we are li we're living in a world where that gospelity message has duped us into thinking that, that if we name it, claim it, we can believe it, conceive it, receive it, and we will achieve it. That's a bunch of hoppycock. Yeah, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says we've been called to die. I'm simply trying to tell you, my friend, you've got to inconvenience yourself. They chose to suffer. They knew it was going to make them say, ouch, but they did it anyway. In fact, my brothers and sisters, while, 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 while these folks uh, were not being selfish and they were being supportive and they chose to suffer, I want to suggest that they made what they did a sacrifice. Because the Bible tells us in verse 18 that they rendered it, it was an, a, 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 a fragrant sacrifice unto the Lord. It's a portrait of who worship is. If I were going to repackage these lines, I'd simply tell you that these people were wisely compassionate. That's what it means to not be selfish. Your turn may be coming. Yeah, that they willingly contributed. They did this because they wanted to. Yeah, and, and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tells us, Paul says, of their own free will when he's describing what they did. Out of their abundance, their generosity, it overflowed in the way they responded to the work of ministry, knowing that it was going to inconvenience them, that, they, that what they did was a witness to the community. That's what a, uh, to suffer means, to be a witness. Say, Lord, help me to be a witness. Yeah, the word witness is in the idiom of the Greek, martyr. That means somebody who's willing to die. Yeah, who understands that I, I've given my life. Listen, I could be a hustler. I could be a businessman. I could really be doing a whole lot of things. I could be a, 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 a lawyer or perhaps a physician, but I've chosen to give up my life in the work of ministry. It's not because this is some glorified opportunity. I mean, I've, uh, I've had to go through some stuff. Yeah, I mean, when you have to fool with y'all, I mean, that's more than a notion. 
And I've already understood you can't please everybody. And what amazes me about this particular work, let me, let me put it to you like this and I'll move on, that we pay thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to physicians and we respect their expertise. We respect our CPA's expertise. We respect our mechanic's expertise. Don't know what he's doing. We respect our lawyer's expertise. And then we'll come to the church and want to argue with the preacher. Because we think we got more sense than one who's speaking for God. Yeah, well, listen, I'm, I'm going to take myself out to fight because I didn't write the letter. I'm just the mailman. Take it up with him. I'm simply saying they made it as an offering. They brought it because what you do, that kind of work, that kind of sacrifice, that kind of suffering comes up before God as an offering. It's a form of worship to Christ. It is. I didn't make that up. It's right there in the text at verse 18. And in fact, it said it was a sweet smelling, fragrant offering. One translation says that it's in the nostrils of God, which brings me to my last point, and I'm going to leave you alone, and that is that because of their having substantial needs, yet they were willing to be sensitive to somebody else's needs, God surely supplied all their needs. He supplied all. Let the church say all. That's the operative word in that line. It's word. You know what all means? Can I help you? It means all. Yeah. And the fact is, this is not a solitary singular letter directed to one person. This is a congregation of people, which means that includes your needs, your needs, and your needs, and your needs, and your needs, and your needs. Touch somebody and say, that means your needs. Yeah, if you fit the construct, if you can pass the litmus test, if you can pass the asset test, that means that if you, with your substantial needs, can yet be sensitive to the kingdom's needs, God will supply all your needs. How does he do it? Because of his riches and glory. That's, 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 that's how he does it because he got it like that. And I know I said that's how he does it, but in truth, that ain't really what you mean when you say how Because Most of us want to know, how's God going to do that? I know that I got more months left than I got money. I know that my change is strange. My cash don't last. My money is funny. I know I got these bills to pay. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. All of that. Telephone disconnect. I'm waiting on my next paycheck. I, all of that. I mean, and, and these babies need milk and diapers. Like God, don't know how to take care of babies. Uh, and I want to suggest to you that it really ought not be your preoccupation or concern about how God's going to do it. Because what you do when you ask, how's he going to do that for me? Is you inhibit, first of all, the, the fact that you should be trusting God. But you also uh, have a tendency in those moments to box God in based upon previous performance. And let me just, as a disclaimer, suggest just because he did it that way last time doesn't obligate him to do it that way again. He could speak the word. He may spit in the dirt and put it on there. He might decide to lay hands on the situation. Uh, he may tell you to go wash, but it, it's not your concern to be figuring out how God's going to do it because God's never limited to what he's done before because he can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, Y'all looking at me strange. You just stretched me. Give me a couple of more minutes. I want to tell you. The fact of the matter is that God has the power, so the Bible tells us to part waters. Is that true? But I need to tell you, he's not limited to parting waters. Now, he could have sent for the children of Israel a big boat by if he'd wanted to. Told them to get on and give them a cruise right across the, from the east bank to the west because he doesn't have to part waters. He could have sent an air vessel down and told them to board and flew them to the other side. He could have dispatched two and a half million angels with an extra pair of wings. Y'all strap these on and they could have flown over. God could have uh, uh, put a sidewalk on top of the sea and told them to walk over on solid land. He could have pulled the east bank from the west and brought the banks together, absorbed the water in the bank, tell them to just take one step and then separated the banks and let the sea unfold. I'm simply trying to tell you that it's not your job to figure it out. Trust God and let him work it out. You got to trust him and let him work it out. So if the issue is not then, how is he going to do it? The issue is why. Say why. why. Because the Bible tells us right there in that verse that what you give reaches the head of God. It's an anthropomorphic reference, inference really, not a reference because it doesn't say this. It's an anthropomorphic inference to the person of God. The fact that it says it comes at God's nostrils. Anthropomorphic is a compound word. Anthropos meaning man, 
morphosis has to do with form. When you hear metamorphosis, you're talking about changing form. But here's a human form reference or inference to God because we've never seen him, so we have to uh, refer to God in human terms. When we assume that God sees, that must mean he has... Yeah, when we say that he hears, it must mean he has... Yeah, if, if God can touch, it must mean he has a... Yeah, so if God can smell... A sweet smelling... That must mean God has a what? So that's the inference there. And that suggests that whatever you do when you serve, the service you give, the sacrifices that you make, when you write that check, it emits an odor into the nostrils of God. I want to ask you a question. But has offering time taken place already? In just a moment, I just want to, uh, I want you to think about this because whatever you give is going to make a smell in the nose of God. And I just want to ask you for my sake, please don't offend him in here today. You're going to get that in a minute. What you give reaches the head of God. Yeah, not only does it reach the head of God, but it affects the heart of God. How do you know that? The text says, still at verse 18, it says, well-pleasing unto him. It's the only other time in the Bible that expression is seen. It says uh, that it is well-pleasing unto him, that sweet-smelling, fragrant offering. The other time you see it is when Jesus got baptized. Matthew makes reference to that in chapter 4. It's the only time in the Bible that the Godhead shows up that's recorded on earth. Jesus is the candidate for baptism. And then the Holy Ghost shows up in the form of a dove. Somebody reads their Bible. But God says, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. And when heaven's open, he spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It, uh, I'm well pleased. It pleases the heart of God. And I'm telling you, the service that you give, the sacrifices you make, the time that you spend working with children, the teaching moments that you give, it ought not be that you're working for your corporation only and spending all that time overtime just for you. If somebody's got to work with these little boys and these little girls, somebody has to train folks who are having a hard time about managing their money and understanding what struggle is all about. Somebody has to make those sacrifices who's been through to help somebody else who's going through and that kind of service touches it affects the heart of God you you think it's your voice that moves God are you, are you serious God's got angels that can make runs that'll make you embarrassed to open your mouth and the truth is we don't know who can sing anyway well we got a skewed perspective we're fallen creatures we don't know who got a good voice because some of us in here have voices that only a God could love. I mean, we, don't, we make folks who can't sing rich. 50 Cent can't sing. We made him a multi-millionaire. Kirk Franklin can't sing. And we made him a multi-millionaire. Bobby Jones, I'm in this town. Y'all better tell me. Bobby can't sing. Not according to the way we think. And I'm simply saying that it's not about you. It's what you do that affects the heart of God. I'm done when I tell you that not only does it affect the heart of God, lastly, it tips the hand of God. Yeah, that's why he supplies it. Yeah, I think of these hands, they're so limited and finite. I've made mistakes, fumbled balls, broken dishes and glasses, other things, valuables. But the, the hand of God that created the world, yeah, scooped out the streams and the oceans, the rivers and the meadows. Yeah, hung the sun around the neck of the universe like a golden medallion twisted the stars into the sip. You know, Mahalia Jackson said he's got the whole world in his hand. And I'm simply trying to tell you, my friends, that if you want the hand of God to have favor in your life, yeah, let me tell you, there's a quick story about a little boy and his mama used to go to the grocery store on Fridays, stop in this country, uh, Virginia store, and he'd look, uh, the manager would see him from the lofty apartment, and when he'd meet him at the register, he'd tell the little boy when mama checked out, thank her for coming. Son, would you like some... Um, uh, uh, candy? He said, yes, sir. He said, well, go ahead and reach in there and get it. He said, sir, would you get it for me? And that happened for weeks, and mama got mad as she got to the car one time and said, son, why you keep asking that? Ain't nothing wrong with your hands. Are you not grateful? He said, mama, I'm very grateful. Eight years old. So, well, why you tell him to do it? She said, mama, his hands are bigger than mine. I'm gone. I'm through. I, 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 may the Lord God bless you real good. I'm just simply trying to say, why you trying to figure it out? If you trust God, he can already work it out. Because he's got the whole world in his hands. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the hymn knowledge is put it like this, that be not dismayed. I'm trying to tell you, Carolina, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. 
Doesn't matter if there's an Obama in the White House, a Reagan or a Bush, that beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you no matter what may be your test. God will take care of you. Lean, weary one, upon my breast. God will. He'll take care of you. I, I'm done. God, God, God bless you. He'll take care of you. I said he'll take care of you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he make a way for you? Won't he make your enemies leave you alone? Won't he put food on your table? Won't he put clothes on your back? God will! Yeah, he'll take care of you. If you would, stand with me all over this church. God bless you. Somebody needs to know that God will. Someone needs to know membership has its privileges. Somebody needed to know today that God can supply all of your needs. God bless you. I appreciate you so very much. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you so very much. I want you to help me now. We want to extend an invitation to somebody who doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Our elders and preachers and deacons are moving. If you have legs to stand and if you can, if you're able, would you just stand with me for a moment? Just do that for me for a moment. It's going to bless you in just a minute, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you. All that we've done this morning was really to get us to this point. Everything that we've done has been to get us to this point in the worship experience. The only reason why God needs our resources is so he can advance his kingdom. so that he can alter behaviors so he, that he can help people to be transformed in their lives and everything that we've done everything that we've done up to this point is so that we can get the attention of somebody who say you know what I need Jesus in my life change. I want to surrender my life to Christ. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what you've been through. But life has certainly been hard and difficult. You've had one mistake on top of another, one issue on top of another, one circumstance on top of another. It appeared that every time you tried to put your hands and your faith into somebody, they, they let you down. You thought this job was going to work. This track was going to be the right track. If I got this degree, it's going to make me happy. If I got this amount of money, if I made this, if I did that, if I drove this, if I lived here, if I wore this, if I had this, it was going to make the difference in my life. If I got married, I just want somebody to love me. If I could just get them to hold me. And you've gotten to a point where you did, but they didn't. You were, but they were not. And somehow you have fallen right back where you were. Brother Irvin, the reason why is because, y'all, the Bible tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these other things I'll add unto you. The problem is, y'all, we keep putting so many things in front of God. And God says, I need to be first. So I want to give you an opportunity today that if you might be here today, I'm looking for three groups of persons, three. Number one, I'm looking for the person who says, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ. I've never surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, I've never, I've 
never been baptized. I've never said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I want to be saved. I've never cried out to him. As a matter of fact, I didn't really even believe there was a God. But it all makes sense to me now. So the first group that we're looking for is persons who've never given their life to Christ, never initiated a relationship with God, never given your hand to a preacher, never surrendered. If that's you, you're in group one. Here's the second group we're looking for. Group two, a person said, Pastor, you know what? I gave my life to Christ, gave my hand to the preacher. I was baptized. I joined the church. I worked out my soul's salvation. But then, Pastor, I got busy doing stuff that I needed to do for me, and I kind of walked away from God. Somebody drove me away, Pastor. Some mean church folk. Somebody drove me away. But I walked away from God. If that's you, you're in group two. The Lord told me to tell you, even though you walked away from him, he never walked away from you. And that your love for him should never be based on anybody else. On him alone should it be based upon. And if you're in group two, he wants me to tell you to come back to him. Here's the third group. Group three. You're saved. You're being sanctified, but you're looking for a church home. I want to recommend this church to you today. I want to recommend it to you. You're saved, you're being sanctified, but you're looking for a church. I want to recommend this church to you. Now listen, I don't care who you are, if you're in group one, two, or three, doesn't matter. Don't pay these folk no mind, they don't have a hell or heaven to put you in. This is about you and God. If you're here, you're in group one, group two, or group three, I want you just right wherever you are. Walk down this aisle, give me your hands. Say, preacher, you're talking to me. I need to surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter who you are, come on. Walk out from where you are right now. We heard the preacher minister to us. Walk out from where you are. I want you to help me for a moment. I want you to ask your neighbor just two questions. Ask your neighbor two questions if you don't mind. Ask your neighbor two questions. Let me give them to you and then I'll tell you when to ask. The first question you're going to ask your neighbor is, are you saved? The second question you're going to ask is, do you have a church home? Saved from what, preacher? From hell. Because without Christ, we're going to end up in hell. Two questions, are you saved? Do you have a church home? The answer to those two questions is either yes, I am, or no, I am not. You don't have to lie because God already knows. If you're here today, it doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter who you are. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Doesn't matter who you are. I want you to ask your neighbor these two questions. One, are you saved? Do you have a church home? I want you to wait for an answer. And if your neighbor says to you, no, I'm not saved. No, I don't have a church. I want you to very lovingly, very warmly ask them, can I walk with you down front? Don't send them by themselves, but you ask them, can you walk with them? I want everyone now, go now, minister to your neighbor, ask two questions. Are you saved? Do you have a church home? I don't care who they are, I said ask. Doesn't matter who they are. I'll wait on you. Listen, if you're saved and you're not ashamed and you're glad about it, I want you to give God the best praise you can for your own salvation. you as you are seated in the presence of God thank you so very much our ushers are in the aisles with envelopes if you need an envelope if you would just so you won't know 
as they are in the aisles with envelopes. Let me just say this to you all. We do not give loose money here in the offering. We account for every dollar that comes through these doors. And so we ask you, sir, you ma'am, that as you give today in this offering, that you would use the envelope, that you would use the envelope, that you would use the envelope. Our ushers are in the aisles. If you need one, slip your hand up right where you are. They'll bring one to you. They'll bring it to you. Thank you for your willingness to comply. Our young people need envelopes on this side, to my left, to your right. Thank you. We're honoring the Lord with our gift now. We're honoring the Lord with our gift. We're going to worship the Lord with giving. We're going to honor God with our gift. Let me say to you that as we're preparing, that we bring God, number one, the tithe. Please listen to me. Watch me, if you will. The tithe simply means a tenth. We give God what rightfully belongs to him. A tenth belongs to the Lord. God's giving you $100. Ten of those dollars belong to him. He just wanted to see if he could trust you to bring it. And so we honor God with the tithe. This might not be your week to tithe, but it is your week to give because whenever we walk into the house of God, we will not come into his presence without offering unto him something. There are several ways we give offerings here in this ministry. Please allow me to explain to you. Number one, we have what's called the ABC offering. It is the above and beyond campaign, the above and beyond offering. And that's where I've asked every member of our ministry, please hear my heart, every member of our ministry, I've asked them that we might give $1,000 over the course of the year above and beyond your normal tithe, your normal giving. The reason why we do that, you all, is because we're seeking to transform lives by advancing the kingdom of God here. This building that you worship in is not our church. It is a, it is a family life center. It is a multi-purpose facility that we use for the community. Just in case you did not know, this is not a church that seeks to hoard everything for itself. We're trying to transform people's lives. And so during the course of this week, during the course of the week, you will see persons who are addicted with drugs and alcohol, you'll see them come in here and get help. At a certain season during the time of our ministry, you'll see this place become a shelter for homeless people. We pull out every chair that you're sitting in. Don't look at me like that. The chair you're sitting in comes out and cocks go down and people come in who don't have shelter. There are persons who come here every month who need food. This becomes a food pantry. It becomes a clinic for those who need a doctor. Because that's what we believe in, transforming lives to advance the kingdom of God. And we were able to buy this building, built this, bought this 18.3 acres of land, and we were able to put this building up. And the next building we're working on is for a group of people that most folk don't want to be bothered with. It's for single moms who are HIV positive or have AIDS and their children. Because God didn't call me to build buildings in the kingdom unto myself. He called me to transform lives. And let's be truthful, y'all. That's why you're here today, because your lives have been transformed. Come on and praise God for transform lives. Transform lives. And so we give by way of our ABC. It helps us to keep doing what God's called us to do, ABC. The second way that we give is through Pastor's Love Offering. We're grateful to God for a pastor who teaches us the Word of God. Even when he ain't preaching on a Sunday, he still teaching us. Amen. On today, I'm going to ask you to do something special for me. I want to be a blessing to Dr. Reginald Terry. Didn't have to stay over from Memphis, but he did. Came here to minister to another church. 
and uh, didn't rush to go back home, so I asked him to come minister to us. I want you to help me be a blessing to this preacher. On your envelope, it'll say guest preacher or guests. I want you to sow a seed into his life today. I want to be a blessing to this preacher. Amen. I want you to be a blessing to the preacher. So whatever way you choose to give, it's your choice. The only one you don't have a choice about is a tithe. There are consequences for you stealing what God has given to you to bring to him. So we bring God the tithe or the offerings. It's your choice. I want you to be certain that the envelope that you in fact are writing on is that it's legibly printed so we can read it. Secondly, I need you to be certain that what's on the outside as the amount is what's on the inside. Make sure you carry all of the ones and that everything adds up. Now in a few moments, God's going to give us a facial expression. It's either going to be a sweet aroma to his nostrils or it will make him sick and cause him to frown. When your gift is ready to present unto the Lord, when you're ready to present that sweet-smelling offering unto him, I want you to stand on your feet, if you will. Take that gift. Stick it up in the nose of God. Every head's bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you through giving. Receive now. In Jesus' name, receive this tithe, this offering. In your name we pray, amen. Now listen, everyone's standing. No one is walking over you, even if you have nothing to give, um, so that the persons who are coming on your row will not have to walk over you. We're going to all walk together, amen. amen. Follow the directions of the ushers, if you will. Thank you. Everyone's standing. Everybody's standing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Everyone stand. We're all going to walk. I don't want anyone to walk over you. Bless you. We're ready. Thank you. Quiet move. Minister, please.
you might be seated in the presence of God. We're going to prepare now to baptize persons. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve persons. That the best y'all can do. Huh? Folks' lives have been transformed and people receiving Christ. I'm going to begin baptizing with our children that are come. Y'all know Pastor and these names, I tell you, boy, y'all are. God bless you. I'm going to need a course. I'm ready, young people. Let's go. We're ready. Prepare to baptize. Our, they're going to be led. Thank you. <laughs> see this on the monitors for those of you who like to see your loved one go down. The first person that we have is Chantel Brown. Chantel Brown joined this ministry on March the 18th, 2014. This young person is tied to the family of the Browns family and the Pringles. Would you help me praise God for Chantel Brown? In the obedience of thou divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear child, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and somebody say, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Take them on down. And we praise God for it. Come on, we bless the name of the Lord. Bless you, baby. All right. Got a little delay on the screen. We're going to figure out how to make it happen. It's going to be a delay. Bless you. Pre Shh. Pronounce your name for me, precious. Cyan. I got it now. Listen, y'all, this is Cyan Brown who joined this ministry March the 18th, 2014. She's also tied to the Brown and the Pringle family. Come on, we praise God for her. In the obedience of thou divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear child, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus. Take her down in the water. Come on, clap your hands, everybody. Hallelujah. I have, I have, I have, yeah. I got Layla Brown. Y'all, she's a songster too. She know how to, know how to sing. I guess y'all can tell this is just one happy family. This is Layla Brown, 
mama and daddy gave their lives back to the Lord and the children came right along with them. Layla, yes, joined this ministry March the 18th, 2014. And again, her, she's tied to the Brown and Pringle family. Her daddy, her granddaddy is Elder Pringle. In the obedience of thou divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear child, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus. Take her down in the water. Come on, y'all, clap your hands, everybody. No, I've been changed. God. I know, I know. I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven done sign my name. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Tamara Brown, who joined this ministry 318 14, and she's also a part of the Brown and Pringle family. Let's clap our hands for her, if you will. In the obedience of thou divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear child, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Take her down in the water. Come on, y'all clap your hands, everybody. Next is going to be Malik Bynum, who joined this ministry. December the 22nd, 2014, 2013, for, excuse me, 2013, and he is connected, Malik is connected to Sister Tanya McClam. Uh, come on, let's praise God for them. In the obedience of thou divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear brother, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. We take them down in the water and the people of God clap their hands all over this place. Amen. I have, is it Hamani? Hamani. Armani Dix, who's come, she joined this ministry 5-18-2014. She's related to uh, Sister Dix, who's a member of our ministry. Would you all help me praise God for her? In the obedience of thou divine command, my sister, and upon your confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, we take her down in the water and the people of God clap their hands. Angels in heaven done, sign my name. God bless you. Is it Khadijah? Huh? Y'all help me. Kadesha, thank you so very much. I'm told you I got to go back to school to learn how to pronounce some of these names. She joined this ministry on May the 18th, 2014, and she's tied to the Dix family. Come on, y'all, let's give God praise for her. Amen. In obedience to thou divine will, will and command, Father, we now baptize this your child in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, we take her down in the water and the people of God clap their hands. Follow me down to the Jordan stream. The angels in heaven done sign my name. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Sister Destiny Dix, who joined this ministry, May the 18th, tied to the Dix family. Would y'all help me praise God for her? 
in the obedience of thou divine command my father and upon your confession my sister we now baptize you in the name of the father in the name of the son in the name of the holy spirit and in the name of jesus we take a town in the water and the people of god clap their hands Ladies and gentlemen, we have little Malik Dix, who's also joining our church. Came 518, 2014, tied to the Dix family. Would you give God praise for Malik? Bless your son. In the obedience of thy divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear son, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. We take them down in the water and the people of God clap their hands all over this place. Well, this is the mama to all of those brown children. We're grateful to have Stephanie Brown. She's coming to give her life to Christ, united with this church on March the 23rd, 2014. She too is tied to the Brown and Pringle family. Could y'all help me praise God for her? Hallelujah. In the obedience of thou divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear sister, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, we take you down in the water right now and the people of God shout glory. glory. Next, ladies and gentlemen, I have Kevin Lowry. Brother Kevin, Brother Kevin Lowry. We thank God for you, Kevin. Appreciate you, man. Kevin has come a long way. He's been around here a long time. King, when his friend was transitioned home, be with the Lord, and he said, I, I'm going to give my life to Christ. Thank you, Kevin, for just honoring your commitment unto the Lord. We welcome you. We welcome you. In the obedience of thou divine command, my Father, and upon your confession, my dear brother, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Son and Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, we take them down now into the water and the people of God, clap your hands, everybody. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have Brother Robert Edwards uniting with this church to come be baptized on March the 16th, 2014. He's tied to the Cassandra, fa the Roberts family, Cassandra Roberts. He's gonna go down in the water as a father, as a son. Y'all, let's give God praise for this young boy who looks just like Jesus. <laughs> Look like Jesus. In the obedience of thou divine command, my father, and upon your confession, my dear brother, we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. We take you down in the water and the people of God shout glory. glory. Now come on and clap your hands for all of the candidates. Give God the best praise you can. Come on, we bless him. out of here we're on our way out would you do me a favor and greet your neighbor and tell him thank you so much for coming come on tell him thank you on behalf of pastor and first lady thank you so much for coming thank you for coming Bless you. if you would remain everyone standing we're on our way out listen if you were one of our first and second time guests 
and you receive one of our gifts. We're so honored to have you. Thank you so much for coming. I told you there was a reception being planned in your honor. I want to give you an opportunity now. Brother Hale, would you put your hand up for me? This young man to my left, to your right, is waiting for you. So why don't you go ahead and gather your things together. Gather your things together and make your way right there to where he is. He's going to lead you right to the reception. First Lady and I will join you in just a moment. Just come right on. That's right. Go right there. Thank you so very much. Appreciate you. Y'all, let's give God praise for these persons, our first and second time guests. We're honored to have you. Thank you for coming and being a part. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Amen. Thank you. Now listen, for those of you who are accustomed to First Lady and I standing here shaking hands, we will not be doing that immediately. We're going to go back and greet our guests, and then we're going to come back and shake hands. And thank you so very much for your obedience and your willingness to follow. So if you're still here when we get back, we'll be more than happy to shake your hand. If you're not, see you. Thank you so much for coming. Amen. Now listen, Dr. Terry, do you feel like shaking hands? Your mind? Good. Dr. Terry's going to come and he's going to stand here. He's going to shake some hands. And I do need you all to get in line and shake his hand, follow the directions of those persons to line us up so that we do it decently and in order. In, in order. Um, and just tell him how much we appreciate him taking time out of his schedule to come and minister to us. Amen. Father, God, watch over your people and keep us as only you can. Thank you for the word that you've deposited into our spirits. God, we certainly bless you for all the souls that have been transformed and baptized on today. Thank you for your spirit, for the songs, for the band, for everyone who helped us to be ushered into your very presence today. God, we bless you, we honor you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.